Hello there, and welcome to the Oldfield Forge Forging Basics, first in what I hope will be many short educational videos to help you get started in the world of blacksmithing. Now, before we get going, I'd like to set a few things straight with you all. I don't claim to be the best blacksmith in Whiterun, YouTube, or even here where I work, but I've been teaching blacksmithing on a nearly daily basis for around seven years now, and I'd like to share some of my techniques to help those of you who are just starting out in this fine craft. Those of you with a bit more experience under your belt may find these videos a little patronizing, and may prefer the more advanced channels like Phoenix Forge or the very talented Torbjorn Armin. As the title suggests, these videos are purely for those who are just getting started. The methods that I show you, or even those that Mr. Armin shows you, are never the only way to accomplish a goal. The methods in these videos are simply the ways that I have found most useful when you're getting started. So if another smith tells you to a completely different method, recall the old saying, two blacksmiths, three opinions, and simply pick the method that works best for you. I'm going to be using a very basic set of tools in my videos. All you'll need to start is a forge, a hammer, and an anvil. As long as you have a place to get your steel hot and a place to hit it, then you can make almost everything else. Although, that being said, save yourself the hassle of making a file, and buy one yourself. I assure you, you'll thank me later. If I do use other tools, I'll put a little shopping list at the beginning of each video, just so you don't get caught out halfway through. On the subject of making tools, today's episode. Coil spring punches, chisels and dots. Coil springs are normally acquired quite cheaply from scrapyards and mechanics, but you can even find small fragments on the side of the road if you start keeping an eye out for them. They generally have a distinctive shear mark where they've come away. Now you're going to need to remove the paint from these springs if you're going to start forging them, especially if you forge inside, so give them a good clean first. Paint thinner and a wire brush is my recommendation, although I do have a rather naughty friend who throws them into a bonfire to burn the paint off. This is not recommended. So the first thing you'll need to do is straighten your spring. You'll have to do this a section at a time. Here you can see me putting the end of the hot spring in the pritchel hole at the end of the anvil and lifting upwards to straighten. If your anvil doesn't have a pritchel hole, then a vice or even a hole in an old gym weight will do. Anything fireproof that will hold one end still. Once you've roughly straightened it out, give it a tap on the outside curve to get those last little angles out of there before moving on to the next section. Eventually, the whole piece should be straight. Your hammer wants to be leaning forward ever so slightly while you hit, and the metal wants to remain nice and flat on the anvil. Lifting the metal off the anvil will cause the metal to try and fill any negative spaces under it instead of flattening it. Widening out the end of your bar here may make it a little messy, so feel free to neaten it up, either on the sides or by hammering it from the back of the anvil. The end doesn't need to be super thin just yet. Prioritize the shape. Just remember, the thinner you forge it, the easier the sharpening will be. Once you have the basic shape of the chisel, and it's nice and straight, heat up the whole thing one more time and leave it on the side to cool down on its own. This is called annealing, and as a general rule, the slower you cool down steel, the softer it will be. This will be important in the next stage. While I'm waiting for the chisel to cool, I'm going to start on the punch and drift. These are very similar starts, as they both require a simple square taper. Lean your hammer forwards away from yourself, and hammer at the very end of the bar. Just like with the chisel, but this time rotate 90 degrees every now and then to keep the bar tapering equally on all sides. Now you can see me here turning the bar left and then right and then left and then right. I often get asked why not simply rotate this continuously in the same direction. You are of course more than welcome to do that, but you may find with a pair of tongs it's a little easier to rotate your hand left and right rather than trying to spin it continuously in your palm. Remember, the hammer works with the anvil. Whenever you squash your side of the bar with a hammer, the anvil squashes the opposite. So by working two sides, I'm affecting all four. Once you've made a square taper as long as you'd like, begin to take off the corners from a square taper to an octagonal one, then from an octagonal one to a hexadecagonal one. Don't worry, we're not expecting a perfect 16-sided shape at this point. Simply follow the corners until it begins to look nice and round. The temptation while rounding is to spin the bar, but I've found that this will make the bar lumpier. Simply follow a corner line to the end of the bar and back again. This, however, does call back to the earlier expression, two blacksmiths, three opinions. Now, an extra step you can do to really round off your taper is hot rasping it. Passing an old farrier's rasp or file you don't mind getting a little soft down the length of your taper will help out any corners you weren't able to remove with the hammer alone. This is a very useful step for a round punch, but simply an aesthetic choice for the center dot. Once your punch is round and your dot is pointy, repeat your annealing step just like the chisel. You can even place them into some sand to help them cool more evenly if they are quite thin. Once cooled, secure your tool and cut off the rough end. 
Here I'm using a leg vise and a hacksaw, but a slit disc and a grinder in this situation will do absolutely fine. Don't worry about affecting the heat treatment with the friction of the grinder at this early stage, it won't change anything. Once the end is chopped off, remove those sharp corners with a sander or file. If your file or hacksaw haven't been biting up to this stage, you may have made your tools too hard too early. Reheat them to a forging temperature and try annealing them again. Remember, let them cool off for as long as they need. You can even bury them in sand or vermiculite to really slow the process down. Your punch will also want a little bit of filing right at the top. To keep an even point, you can also do the exact same thing you did with a hot rasp here, and go over those rough edges, really making it as round as it can go. Time to put these tools into the fire for the final time, and begin our hardening process. Remember, there are different thicknesses here, and we don't want to accidentally burn off a thin filed end by accident. If you're using a solid fuel fire, then I recommend a nice slow roast on top of it, and allow the heat to seep through slowly. We only need the working ends on the tools to be hard. You should find this gives a bit more shock absorption on the back end. And once we have a nice hot working end, we're going to move the steel from the fire to a nice vat of oil in a single quick motion. You'll notice that my hand is at an angle here. I don't want those flames shooting directly up my arm, I have precious little arm hair left as it is. The reason we are using oil here over water is that the oil is a little gentler on the higher carbon steel and doesn't cool it too quickly, which in this case would make the work a little too brittle and may even crack in the quenching. Now a lot of blacksmiths will use a lot of different oils. Generally I tend to use vegetable oil for a number of reasons, the main one being cost. Now you saw that vegetable oil didn't have a massively high flash point as evidenced by the plume of flame shooting up my arm. If you work in a slightly more flammable forge then may I suggest a different oil. There are cheaper and better oils out there, but please do consider the advantages and disadvantages of them before buying. I used to work in an outdoor forge and used a big oil drum of engine oil for my quenching. It was so cheap the mechanics gave it away for free, but bear in mind how carcinogenic burning motor oil is in an enclosed environment. Vegetable oil isn't much, and it's better for your lungs. I'd still recommend a well-ventilated area though. After your steel has been in the oil for about a minute, take it out. Remember, this metal is currently hardened but not tempered yet, and it's going to be very brittle, so don't be too rough with it. Give it a rub around in some dirt. This isn't anything to do with the heat treatment, but you'll find it is a little easier to clean, and you'll end up with less gunk and oil whenever you clean them up. Quick warning here, when you're checking to make sure the metal is cool, be extra careful. You want it to be fully cooled. The oil on the surface can still be incredibly hot, and it tends to stick to you a little bit more aggressively than the hot steel. When it's all cooled, head over to the sink and give it a scrub with some soap and a scouring pad. This seems like an odd thing to do, but it will help you see the tempering colours in the next stage. You may also want to wash your hands to reduce any chance of getting any leftover oil on your work. Give it a good old scrub with a wire brush or even some sandpaper to reveal the steel to the air. Make it nice and shiny. Now I'm going to show you how to temper. There are much easier ways than this, and the way I normally prefer, assuming that you have an oven, Simply place the tools into an oven around 210 degrees for about an hour, then turn your oven off and let them cool on their own. That's the way I do most of my tools, and generally you'll get a more even temper. However, that being said, I'm going to show you what to look for if you don't have an oven, or simply don't have the time. And frankly, sometimes it can be better to do a traditional temper. So here we go. So I'm just going to target the thicker ends of my tools here. The back end isn't hardened as much, and it doesn't matter if we soften it. It's all about the working end. So, I'm going to be gently heating up the back end to allow the heat to travel down to the working end. We are dealing with much lower temperatures here, only around 200 degrees, so we don't want to put the working end in about a 1000 degree fire and end up overshooting. Although, if that does happen, don't worry, simply rewind to where I was showing you how to harden and try again. The reason we cleaned up our tools here is because we wanted to see the colour change. We don't want any oils or dirt stopping us from seeing that fantastic golden colour at the end of our tools. Now it's not just for decoration, the colour in the steel will indicate how hot it is and therefore how tempered your steel has become. You're aiming for a nice golden bronze colour. If you overshoot into a purple or a blue, don't worry, it'll still work, it just may end up being a little bit softer than perhaps it wants to be. But on the plus side, it's a lot less likely to crack. As you can see on the punch here, the colours start from where it was hottest and migrate down towards the working end. Apologies for my camera work here, I'm still learning. And once your tempered tools have been cooled down, feel free to keep those colours or brush them off. They are entirely aesthetic at this point. And there we have it. If everything went to plan, you now know how to turn a coil spring into basic blacksmithing tools, and hopefully learned a little bit about heat treatment along the way. 
If you've enjoyed this little lesson on basic blacksmithing, feel free to subscribe. If you have any questions or recommendations, feel free to comment down below or email me at oldfieldvideo at gmail.com. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.